Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Say good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> it's mostly just because I know this is going to be a very verbal and interactive crowd this evening. Uh, I'm Laura Lee Everett, the Director of Artistic Services for Opera America, and I want to thank you. I stacked the panel with friends and everything. Uh, thank you all for coming this evening. This is the second in our offering of professional development series, Making Connections, this year. Uh, and I feel like this is a topic that we've had an awful lot of people ask an awful lot of questions about. Um, I won't bore you with telling you who our fabulous panel is other than to say that they're fabulous and I feel like this is a really good group of folks for you to ask questions of. Feel free to be as interactive as you like whilst we go through this. Um, and they will certainly be as interactive back. But I would like to thank Stephen Brody and, and Carolyn Bird, Andrew Lunsford, Eric Ensler, and Sarah Baird Knight for being here this evening and helping you talk about your internet presence. I'd like to welcome our streaming audience. Part of the reason you guys have the microphones is more for the stream than this room, uh. so that this all gets picked up. Uh, members are watching live. Uh, and able to enjoy this evening's seminar. They will also be able to watch it, and anyone you would like, and you can go back and watch it as many times as you want. Uh, starting tomorrow, it'll be archived on our YouTube site. This is one of the many member benefits is that all the professional development events are free for members. So if you're not already a member, for a mere $75, all this and more can be yours. Please feel free to ask me if you'd like more information about what the benefits are. And um, without further ado, I will hand it over to Sarah. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks for coming. I think this is on. Yeah. Uh, so, very quickly, we're just going to introduce ourselves. Um, if I could get the nickel version from each of you for the audience on what brings you here today. Starting with Eric. Sure. Start with Eric, yeah. Uh, my name is Eric Ensler. I'm the um, president of a company called Capacity Interactive. We work with uh, performing arts organizations, ballets, operas, theaters, performing arts centers, and we advise them on everything digital from website redesign to social media strategy to how they use email um, to using analytics um, to understand how people are interacting with their digital properties. I'm Andrew Lunsford. I'm an I'm a active tenor, operatic tenor. <laughs> um, I'm also the largest one at the table, in case you didn't already notice that. <laughs> <laughs> I came from a background Only physically. that was... What's that? <laughs> yeah, physically, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I came from a non-opera background where I owned a company, and uh, it was a granite countertop company. I had about 40 employees, and on the way to grossing about $6 million in sales when the economy declined and we lost that and everything else and I found my way to singing yay which pays you know <laughs> about the same really as bankruptcy well. <laughs> 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 but um, I, I'm still a, a diehard entrepreneur and I'm the co-founder with along with my business partner at the end Stephen Brody of a web-based scheduling application for arts organizations that we founded since I've been a, a singer in the past Mm -hmm. six years or something like that so that's going to be coming out uh, probably early 2014 sometime so that is that's me nice Thanks, to meet you Andy. <laughs> and I'm Ann Carolyn Bird I'm also an active uh, performer working this year mostly at the Metropolitan Opera um, and I have I had a blog starting in 2002 before blogs were mm -hmm. before blogging was an industry <laughs> And actually, I kind of ended my, my main blog right as the industry was starting up um, for many reasons, which I think we'll get into tonight. Um, but I maintain an active internet presence and feel very strongly about um, young people especially being aware of their what they put out there on the internet and um, how to use it to market yourself and how to have a brand, but also how to be smart and, you know, so. Thank That's you. Fun. And Brody. And my name is Stephen Brody. Call me Brody. I'm uh, the co-founder of that gentleman over there of Schedule Arts. And I've also been a freelance uh, web designer and developer for seven years. I'm also a active bass baritone as well. Thank you. And I'm Sarah Baird Knight. I'm a publicist with Dot 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 Music. We do publicity for new music ensembles, festivals, and artists. We work with David T. Little a lot with Beth Morrison projects. Um, we did PR for the Prototype Festival last year, and we'll again this year. 21C Lederabend 
et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, before that, I was with Boozy and Hawks, where I represented John Adams and got to work with Nixon in China at the Med and Dr. Atomic and all that great stuff. So that's what brings me here. And I was a music teacher, actually. I'm a French hornist, and um, I sing and songwrite, but my voice is, is not opera big. And um, so I, I was a musician first, and then I got into publicity after being a music teacher for a few years. And so I love teaching people about PR and promotion, and I'm very happy that they invited me to be here today. Uh, so we'd love to get to know a little bit about you. By show of hands, um, could we see who here is a performing artist? Excellent. Okay. Lots. And how about artistic administrator? Anybody here representing an institution? We're former. Anyone with that background? <laughs> Anybody both? Because we, mer we wear more than one hat, right? Okay. Excellent. Who am I missing? Am I missing any demographic that might be here? Composers. <laughs> Composers, yes, of course. There, front row. There we go. How could I forget composers? <laughs> Great. Okay, that's good. And um, some more, some more polling here. So, who here has a personal website? Aha. Uh -huh. um, who is active on Twitter? Facebook. Okay. Who of those who use Facebook? Who uses it both professionally and personally? Okay, that's good to know. Any other questions that we want to ask? Okay, so here we go. Um, so we're gonna start out, we have, we have some questions here that we're gonna go through and then at the end we'll open it up so that you guys can pop any questions that you've been holding on to and that uh, we may be able to answer for you. So we're starting out talking about identity, artistic identity, um, how we communicate it, mission statements. We were talking before and Andy said that he noticed uh, some artists recently who have mission statements on their website which is a new thing. I haven't really seen much of that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to turn it first to Eric to ask about that. Do you think that an individual artist needs a mission statement? And if so, what might that be like? If not, what might you recommend instead? Um, I think if you have a mission statement, it, you know, I'm not saying you need one or you don't, but I think it's not something you necessarily probably put publicly. Um, if you're looking for, you know, you know, the mission statement can be broad for many things too, like what you're interested artistically or, you know, in my world, which is which is marketing. So when you're thinking about how you're positioning yourself um, to the larger world, it, it may be worth something, you know, spending the time to think about that um, and and make a plan for yourself. But I, w I wouldn't be as transparent as to mm -hmm. make it a public mission statement because I think that could be off-putting. I think, you know, you, what works in social media, even for the institutions that you know my company represents, is um, people are on, are on social media because they want to have like a human connection. They either something that's really funny or really emotional or really powerful. Um, that's that's what connects the people on social, um, and often it's very visual. What we see for our clients is we we encourage every single post to do something visually. And you also want to make it about, you know, not so much always about you. So when you're thinking about um, how you're, you know, you're going to position yourself socially, whether you have a mission statement or not, um, you know, I think that's, that's, that's up to you. I don't necessarily yeah. know the answer. And to our performers here, uh, how do you communicate your artistic identity? I mean, I would recommend that this is something that you communicate through your bio, but what do you guys think about this? We were kind of talking about it before the panel started. Um, we don't necessarily individually have mission statements, but we have, as you know, the, everyone knows about the about rebranding or about branding yourself. And it, in today's um, image-driven market, you have to know who you are. You have to know what your brand is, what you're bringing to the table, what makes you special. Mm -hmm. And so, the the words vision statement are in here, and I think. I know when I'm getting ready to have do a new photo shoot or create a new website, I just start collecting adjectives of things I want people to get when they are when they see me or are interacting with any of my materials. So that's not so much a mission statement, but it's definitely trying to make a clear picture of who I am in the in the eyes of 
people who see me yeah. through my media. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and kind of to expand a little bit on that, um, you know, when we talk about branding, I'm actually going through this right now. I've spent the last year or so transitioning from a bass baritone to a baritone and, and kind of being in this sufficient Spock area. And for a performer, you know, a vision statement per se encompasses not just what you have in social media and what you have on your website and stuff like that, but it's really coming down to understanding who you are as a performer. What are the types of repertoire that you do? How do you want to present that to, you know, the companies that are going to hire you and such like that? So it starts from a base of understanding what you're trying to accomplish as a performer to begin with, and then using the tools like your website and such to actually present yourself in a light in which they can see that. Mm -hmm. So for yeah. instance, you know, if I want to play some villains and such, I want to be able to put out imagery through social media and through my website that are going to play to that rather than trying to do it with a bunch of really super bright colors and such like that, um, which I can get into the design aspects more of it later. But yeah. you know, I think that when it comes to a vision statement, it's about encompassing all of that together, not just necessarily one or two pieces. Yeah, that, absolutely. I couldn't have said it better. Mm -hmm. And then adding to that a little bit of a you know, publicist advice. It, I would say that you know in your in your bio you want to communicate who you are, what you care about, what you're good at, you know what makes you special, mm -hmm. as um, mm -hmm. Anne Carolyn said. Um, and then as you progress, you want to be able to use other people's words to say that about you. Mm -hmm. So in, you know when you first start out, you, your bio is all in your own words, or maybe you've hired somebody to write it for you. But then over time, you want to pull those quotes from press that that reinforce that point of who you are and what makes you special and what you're good at. And over time, that's how you build your, your PR reputation, that you get other people to say about you what you are trying to say about yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. Regarding the mission statement slash identity question, um, I totally agree with what Eric was saying. I'm, I wouldn't knock somebody for, for trying to do that. Obviously, they're, they're out there trying to create some sort of branding, some sort of action clarity, whatever it is, but the point of a, bit of a mission statement is really to, it's, it's an internal thing that's really meant to add focus to what you are doing. It's, it's usually used in business and it's, it's, it's to help, you know, say what you, who you are, what you're doing, what you're about, and now those are things that you want to define for yourself on a personal level. Um, and, and I think it would be important to keep those two things those two things separate. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that for yourself. In fact, it's probably a good exercise, but I would keep them separate. Yeah, and, and that translates to the next thing we want to talk about, which is websites. Um, Andy mentioned before that um, he's noticed that the, the first and sometimes only place that, that organizations go to to find talent is the web, and it's absolutely true. Um, we never use any kind of physical materials. I mean, we're, we're almost a completely digital company. Um, there are still brochures, obviously, marketing stuff. But when it comes to, you know, you meet someone at a party and you want to know more about them, or you meet someone at a performance and they say that they're a performer and you want to know about their career, the first thing you do is Google them, mm -hmm. right? And so you have to have a website. For some people, that's daunting. You may not think that there's enough about you to have a full website, and for that, there's about.me, which is like a one page, basically. It's like a one page website. But anyway, um, so let's talk about websites, what we need, what we recommend for them. I'm just going to toss it out to everybody. Um, and we can, we can even like, start at the end and come down the line. What needs to be on a website? What you need, the very basic level, um, as far as a performer is concerned, is pretty much just the base materials that you would send in for an audition. Uh, you know, one of the things as I'm going through this is my voice has changed a lot in the last two years. Basically, the website that I'm developing for myself right now has nothing more than a couple really good photos, headshots. Uh, it's got my bio, my resume, and my contact information. I don't have any good quality clips yet because I haven't recorded anything new. I'm learning all brand new music. So the interesting part about it is I'm basically starting over from complete scratch almost. And you don't need much more than that because a lot of times as long as you have accessible information about who you are and what you've done, that's really what you need. Then they may ask, do you have clips or, or other extraneous things? But outside of that, you can kind of manage that on an individual basis. I can't add anything more. I think that's that's right <laughs> for the basic when you know, yeah. if you're just starting out. And some finer points. So biographies, um, usually there's short bio, medium bio, long mm -hmm. bio. 
Short bio is less than 200 words. It's good even to have a mini bio, which is less than 50 words. So a mini at 50, short around 200. Medium is like 350, 400, and then long is 600 or more. As your career goes on, you can say more, but what I found is the longer someone's career goes on, the shorter their bio can be. No. <laughs> right? Um, also, a bio does not need to start at birth and then go chronologically. I, there was a Twitter discussion a couple of years ago that was really funny uh, where somebody was, was complaining about a bio where it was like, you know, prodigy this and prodigy that. And, and we said, yeah, born at a very young age. You know, it was like the opening line. <laughs> um, you know, start with who you are. Don't start with when you started piano lessons. Mm -hmm. Just a little tip. Um, and about the, the photos, um, I don't know if you guys have encountered this, but for print media, so for if, if they're going to put your photos in a brochure, for example, or a program, or if Time Out New York wants to run your photo, it has to be high res. Mm -hmm. It has to be at least one megabyte, preferably two, and that means it also needs to be 200 or 300 DPI or higher, or else it is completely useless in print, no matter how gorgeous it is. 300 so, is the minimum base recommendation. Yeah, 300 is better, yeah. yeah. So I usually say if it's not two megs and if it's not 300 DPI, it is not high res. Now also know this too, yeah. most of the professional photographers you go to, when you ask them to get your headshots, generally some of them will just email them to you now uh, or FTP them. But if you ask them specifically for high res ones, they'll provide you with those specifications. So they'll know full ahead of time that for print, that's what you're gonna need. Yeah. Regarding websites um, and the materials that that we just talked about, I, I totally agree. First, just to start, you got to have headshots, bio, resume. It's, it's I mean, you should have some form of media clip as long yeah. as it yeah. doesn't make you look bad and give off a bad first impression. <laughs> and you does, have to get permission from the composer yeah. and yeah. The, if there's a publisher and all right. that. Yeah. So do your due diligence, but uh, you know, that's it, it goes with headshots. Don't provide glamour shots or Polaroids or something like that. You know, I, there's a lot of websites out there for singers, and there's a lot of really bad websites out there for singers. And would you walk into an audition wearing, you know, clothes that have holes in them or, or you know, cutoffs or your hair like a crazy person? Yeah, obviously that's not the first impression you want to give off in an audition. And nowadays, as we mentioned earlier, this is the first place they're going. You're going to get Googled before you, before you know it. They're not even going to hear your voice before they see your, your photos. So make sure that if you're going to put these things up on the internet that never goes away, then make sure that it's good stuff. Excellent. Um, Brody, can you talk a little bit about web design? And you know, all from like do it yourself easy yeah, to absolutely. hiring a designer, some different mm -hmm. options for folks? Yeah, um, hiring a designer, it's always a very interesting question. When should you hire a designer? Uh, when you can afford one. And by that, I mean the websites that I normally do custom are anywhere between three to $10,000. Not cheap, uh, which happens to also be one of the reasons why I got into this. And uh, <laughs> I, I kid you not. Literally, I, uh, seven years ago, I was a broke college student, not too far away from what we are now as performers. Uh, but, you know, I was a broke college student. I didn't have the money to pay for a really good website. And especially back then, I mean, it was only six, seven years ago, mm -hmm. the technology available to create your own website was just basically non-existent. Mm -hmm. It just didn't happen. So I either had to build it myself or pay somebody an exorbitant amount of money. So that's what got me into this to begin with. Nowadays, though, we're really, really lucky. There are tons of different sites, uh, specifically the ones to look at right now are Weebly.com, Wix.com, Squ uh, Squarespace. Mm -hmm. Those are three that are really great. They're cheap. They're able to get you something up online rather quickly. Could you repeat those again? Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, Wix, W-I-X.com, Weebly, W-E-E-B-L-Y.com, and Squarespace. I... For example, I'm not a web designer. I'm an amateur in that area mm -hmm. up here. I made my husband a from scratch website. He's also a singer in a week from the time I started to the time it was live um, and, and up. And, and, and it has video clips and lots of pictures and, um, and everything. And it was just really fun. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Which, yeah. Which platform did you use? I used Wix.com. Wix, okay. Mm -hmm. MattBurns.com. 
Shameless plug here. <laughs> no. Squarespace, and then and a, a, about me, like I mentioned earlier, is, yeah. is like a one pager. It's mm -hmm. just about dot me, mm -hmm. and you can create a one page website. So you don't have to have you know extra navigation and fill out more pages of information. Exactly. Another option. Yeah. No, absolutely. And um, you know, I guess to plug myself a little bit. Hopefully, uh, by the end of this year, I'm actually rolling out another subscription style service that's building sites specifically for singers. Um, and to get to the nitty gritty and the difference of kind of what I'm doing versus what the other sites do, because it'll give you an idea for what you need is in particular one of the things you're going to start finding is that mobile compatibility is going to be huge it's already starting to be to the point where i have a number of friends of mine both in europe and here who are singing at the mid to high levels who are getting their auditions by literally having people stand there with their cell phone in their hand on the side of the street and listening to the clip i'll tell you this that it's by 2014 by the end of next year yeah visits on a, a mobile site will will overtake visits on a desktop so all the work we do for our clients, we now do what we call mobile first. Mm -hmm. So if you're designing a website, it should be designed first for, for mobile devices awesome. and then secondarily for desktops and tablets because the, you know, the desktop's gonna become a relic. Exactly, and actually that's what I'm working on building right now is a completely mobile first solution. Uh, also something that's a little bit easier because as performers, some of the hard things that you're gonna run into when building these sites at the moment are putting your resume online in a nice table format that actually looks good is really hard. Yes. Getting that onto a mobile device, it's basically unreadable in, in its desktop form. So I'm actually working on building a system that will allow it to be completely set in those regards. Mm -hmm. Now the nice part about what the sites like Wix and Squarespace and such like that are is they have mobile elements to them but some are better than others. Squarespace, in my opinion, is probably the best one available at the moment because it's built with mobile first in mind. Mm -hmm. um, but mobile is gonna be something that you're really gonna need to take a look at very, very quickly, especially when it comes to your media. Your media is gonna be a big thing. Once you start having your audio and video clips in particular, the very first thing I'm gonna to have to tell you is stay away from Flash on every regard. How many oh, people in here happen to have an iPhone? Yeah. Okay. If you had a Flash website or you had a Flash media player, none of you could see it on your phones. Yeah. You wouldn't be able to access it. Yeah. And, it's, and it is all over Singer websites because oh, it's, it's flashy, but it's yeah. really impractical. Yeah, it is. And, yeah. and all, the same with, with autoplay. When, when, oh. when oh. Nobody <laughs> likes that. Just so you know, nobody in yeah. the whole world likes to go to a website and have the music start blaring at you without you clicking play. Yeah. So yes. don't do that. Do yeah. Nobody likes not. it. Yeah. It's it's a well, fact. A whole licensing issues with autoplay too. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. That. Oh, yeah. I learned the hard way from ASCAP and BMI uh. um, that you have to come up with a completely different sync license if you have music that automatically. She said you don't there's want to have other to navigate issues if you for the webcast. She said she said there's <laughs> other licensing issues if you have autoplay <laughs> that are very important. <laughs> now these websites that we mentioned, um, or these platforms that we mentioned, mm -hmm. they are mobile optimized, right? Like they will automatically yes. translate your content to mobile devices. Correct. Now there's there's a difference between, and to get, yeah, kind of in that nitty gritty, there's, uh, in web jargon, there's a difference between mobile optimized and mobile first. Essentially, the main difference here is that what mobile optimized does is they create a separate website basically as a subset that your mobile phone will get sent to that then has everything kind of crammed in the way it needs to be so that you can actually read it on a mobile device. In a mobile first setting, the vast majority of sites now are using what's called responsive design. And essentially what that does is you start with a mobile first design. The entire website is uh, designed based on a mobile device and then expanded out into iPad, tablet, and uh, desktop. But the good part about it and what it does is that you have one single website that automatically adapts itself to the device itself. It knows what it's being viewed on. Exactly. And what that does is it actually gives you a much greater sense of control because, for instance, what you'll find with sites like Dynamod in particular is one that I know a lot of my singer friends use. They have a primarily it's flash based, but they also have an HTML static version for the mobile sets. The problems with those types of subscription services, especially with Dynamod in particular, is that I would probably say on average 75% of the stuff that you have on your Flash version doesn't make it to the mobile. I actually, just to kind of brush up on it again today, I, uh, 
went to a couple friends of mine who had Dynamod and I checked them all on my phone. Mm -hmm. Out of all of them, each one had maybe six, seven pages to their website, bios, resumes, all of that. The only thing I could get was their homepage. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden I've got no access to any of the information I need. And a number of other sites that have that mobile optimized version have a higher probability of having that happen because it's just slightly older technology. Uh, if you have the opportunity, especially looking early, um, Squarespace in particular is probably the best that I had mentioned uh, until Inspired Revolutions comes around. <laughs> um, they're responsive. And what yeah. that's going to do is give you a lot better control because all you have to do is you know for a fact that when it gets checked on any type of device, that information is going to be there and it's going to be designed in a way that it fits the device. Yeah. We use Squarespace. I yeah, exactly. So, um, so in short, if you don't have a website, you're missing gigs, and you have a week to get well, it up. I wanna <laughs> <laughs> it can be done. It can be done. It add, can be done. Add to that. I mean, when you Google someone's name, I mean, it's not only about your website. I think it's, yeah. you know, if you, yeah. if you don't have a website, like, you can have a professional profile on LinkedIn or, or, or Facebook or Twitter. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are Google+. Plus. Those are going to come up. So, I mean, and oftentimes those are going to come up before your websites because those sites are optimized yeah, for search. Right. I mean, yeah. you yeah, have right. it's true. the benefit of, you know, Facebook's focus on SEO or, or LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. They all want to be first because they want to be the place that people are clicking for. The other thing to look at is Google mm -hmm. image search. Um, yeah, what right. what image, especially as right. a performer, and you're, you know, you want to <laughs> see which images of yours are coming up in the, the Google image search. Um, if any image is tagged with your name, um, you, you know, you want to make sure you have a sense of where that's coming from and, and, and what it is, especially when you're talking about yeah. oh, absolutely. Absolutely. starting your image, this question. Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. One of the great mysteries of Google, someone or something for me, is how do those items have a priority. How does right. get to the top? Uh, Eric, do you want to take I that? I can tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so Algorithm. So um, <laughs> Google's, Google's primary uh, purpose is to deliver the most relevant search results to the person who searches it. So when you search something, as someone who's on search, you're looking for something very specific. And so there's thousands of factors in the algorithm. But mm -hmm. primarily, um, for example, if you're going to have a website and your website's URL, so there's keyword, uh, there's keys within every website that tells Google where to index it. For one, what is the URL? So if someone's searching Opera America, well, there's this website called Opera America. That's a good indicator. If people are linking to the site from saying, I visited Opera America, and the, the hyperlinked keyword has the word Opera America, it's going to be a sign of Google that says this, this site's about Opera America. Also, the names of the, the page titles, the H1 tags, or mm -hmm. so the title tags of the page. The National Opera Center is, you know, at Opera America. That's the H1 tag. Or the words on the page are all about opera. So if you're looking at your personal website and you want Google to, you mm -hmm. know, think about your sort of keywords. What keywords do you want to associate with your site? Perhaps your voice type, where you've performed, what your name is. So if you can optimize your site around those keywords based on those things I mentioned, that's going to push you further up the search rankings. Yeah. And the more people go to your website, the higher it goes up. The more people link to your website, as mm -hmm. you were saying, yeah. the higher it goes up. Popularity the, boosts it. Yeah, the linking, yeah. the linking from rep, and also, well, the linking from reputable sources is what's going to boost you the highest because mm -hmm. a singer's website is not going to get a lot of web traffic. Mm -hmm. So ideally, if you can get like, you know, say you sang at a, a major opera house or, or the Seattle Opera, if they can link to your site from their website and you can link back so they look so google looks for that reciprocal linking yeah. that is going to boost yeah. your 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 yeah. seo ranking yeah. mm -hmm. great question yes okay <laughs> we will is the website the first look these days, or is Facebook the first look these days? It really depends. And what do you yeah. do about who I have a you are and yeah. where you put more of yourself? It does depend. I have a, I have a singer who's a, who's a very successful professional singer, and he doesn't have a web page. He just has it a It breaks Facebook my heart. Page. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, I, he's, yeah. Doing, he's, he's doing extremely well without yeah. it. But, I mean, yeah. it's all of his media is right there on yeah. Facebook. I think it also kind of depends sometimes on how people are actually uh, reaching out to you in that regard. If somebody's just doing a general search, um, you have a higher probability of having your Facebook uh, profile come up than you necessarily do on like a page one rank in Google versus your website necessarily. 
but for instance, if you're actually having it in a situation where somebody has contacted you directly, most of the time, in my experience, they're going to ask for what your website is. They're not going to ask for your uh, Facebook profile. But a general search may come up with Facebook. Networking-wise, uh, if you meet someone at a party, they're probably going to go to Facebook. Yeah. You right? can't claim. And, but, but, like, you know, if it's, if it's just in general that someone heard about you, they're going to Google you, and really whatever, whatever site comes up first and looks the most yeah. promising to them is what they're going to click on. Like, this, you know, this looks like the most rich with information. I'm going to click here. Mm -hmm. We're going to segue into social media because we only yeah. have about 15, 10, 15 more minutes, mm -hmm. um, which is crazy. That was quick. But, yeah. but yeah, let's, <laughs> let's dig in. So, I know a lot, mo I think there were two people that were on Twitter. Um, <laughs> so let's talk just briefly about what happens on Twitter in our world that is useful. Can I, I'll, I'm going to start with this and okay. because I'm probably going to be the black sheep of this panel and get jumped on like a trampoline, but I, I'm not on Twitter. I have no desire to be on Twitter. I hope I'm never on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So you're not the guy to talk about Twitter. Yeah, that was, let's talk about the other thing. <laughs> no, I, I have something to say about it though. I think that Twitter is, it's a fun thing. It's, it's neat, but I think I see more people get into trouble using Twitter because they, they remove the filter from their brain to their mouth. Okay. You know, I mean, it's too fast, it's too instant. Is there anything, I mean, if you're using it as a professional tool, is there anything you're saying right now that is so important that it couldn't be said on Facebook or in some other thing where you've had a chance to actually think about what you're saying and what you're putting out into the, the everlasting ether? Well, yeah, every so, tool has yeah. its... Yeah has its, you know, like special powers and its pitfalls. For <laughs> 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 okay, no, and Carolyn okay. was talking okay. about this. this is my I do, I, there was an article in the Times uh, just four days ago about um, Valentina Lisitsa, the yeah, pianist. The article. You read it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and <laughs> I thought it was very interesting, especially in light of coming here to do this. She basically Can't says, I'll, I'll sum it up, she said, <laughs> classical musicians are terrified of, um, she says they're stifling themselves because they don't want to make a mistake. Okay. And mm -hmm. now I, I was raised by a Southern woman. I know Likewise. about decorum and propriety and all that, what is important. And so I'm very aware of always, you know, trying to think carefully when I put things out there. Filter. But uh, to filter, <laughs> yes. But I, I also think, you know, she says, you know, look at, um, at pop music and at other mm -hmm. other performing arts, they there's no bad publicity, right? So if you get out there and you say something rather controversial, <laughs> you know, as it could not, yeah. it's not necessarily a bad thing. I I didn't really expect that I would say that tonight, yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but I, I just think I you, Twitter is dangerous, but also really exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to so jump you, in yeah. for a second, if you don't mind, yeah. Um, yeah. to Let talk about know Twitter. Saying. So I have gotten stories for at least three of my clients via conversations that were that came up on Twitter. Journalists are on Twitter. Artistic yep. administrators mm -hmm. are on Twitter. It, it's a huge uh, place where, where journalists hang out all day long because they deal in headlines. And a headline is less than 140 characters, and you can link to it. Mm -hmm. So, so Twitter is a place where composers and artists, artistic administrators, publicists, journalists are all hanging out. There's a very lively classical community on Twitter. It's like a water cooler. They're talking all day long. They're sharing stories. They're swapping links. They're arguing about different musicological matters that just really tire me sometimes. But <laughs> it's... It's, it's very active and it's lively. Now, it may not be your thing, and if it's not your thing, we never advise our clients <laughs> yeah. to get on a social media outlet or platform that they are not comfortable dealing in. It'll just make them look awkward and cranky. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how I look? Do yeah. I look awkward, awkward and cranky? And cranky. <laughs> I think I do. Okay. But, I actually am really but, curious to your point on this, too. Well, I mean... Uh, Similar to, to what Sarah was saying, I mean, the difference between, you know, is it going to, that you can't say it on Facebook, you can't on Twitter, and, and you brought this point home, you're speaking to a different community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Facebook is really speaking to, a, it's more, it is a real professional communication tool. Um, people within certain industries, because you can tag or hashtag on Twitter, so you can have 
you know, you sort of gate that conversation within certain professional realms. And I mean, it, it is, a you know, for journalists, it really is. That's why you got stories out of it. So as opposed to Facebook, which is more of a gated community, because for people to see your content on Facebook, they have to already have liked you. So, um, you know, it, I think they mm -hmm. serve different purposes. Yeah. yeah. And for yeah, Twitter, I, I mean, um, for Twitter, it's true. Yeah, it's a quick medium and you can spout off and you can say something. But the thing, it goes back to your artistic identity, who you are as a performer. Now, Nico Muley mm -hmm. would, mm -hmm. would not function on Twitter well <laughs> if he were to bridle himself. That is not his brand. He is mouthy and he's inappropriate <laughs> and he says offensive things. But that's who he is as an artist. And so he can he can do that on Twitter. And and you know like bad PR well it's not bad PR for him because that's absolutely who he oh, is. Look at Miley Cyrus. However, <laughs> if you are if that's yes. not your identity that's as an mm -hmm. artist it's real then you have to make sure that you don't behave that way right. publicly. I mean, it's it's the same with any kind of public behavior, mm -hmm. that you're communicating who you are, and you have to make sure that you're willing to accept the consequences of whatever you say and do, <laughs> and, uh, and do you want it to impact the way you, you know, be aware of the impact, and is that impact your intention, mm -hmm. always, That's in any platform? Good. Yes. Could you just take 10 seconds? I've, I've read it a million times in the New York Times, but I still don't know how it works. What's hashtag? Uh, okay. Uh, uh, um, sure. A hashtag is certain social media like um, Twitter or Inst Instagram has it. Okay. So it allows it, it's a search device that narrows down a topic. So if I was going to be talking about opera, I would put hashtag opera or for you know my world is hashtag arts marketing or hashtag digital marketing so if someone so, so get both your identifier and the hashtag it, it, there, it's a narrowing a tool for, for, the, for the search sorry yeah. it's a it's a way to filter a search so if you're going to search for uh you know certain events and tv shows have hashtags so if you go into to twitter which is a search engine and you put in hashtag opera it'll pull down all the conversations that people have tagged as as opera yeah. same with instagram so for facebook example, doesn't you know, have it if this event had a hashtag if it were you know opera, like hashtag opera america promo talk mm -hmm. just to say then oh, people who were not here this evening and who don't know you and who don't necessarily follow you on Twitter, if you were tweeting and then you were putting hashtag, you know, Opera America promo talk, they would be able to pull up the search and see what everyone is saying about this panel. Does that make so sense? Functioning on Twitter can consist of looking and seeing things, not necessarily saying things. That's right. Both. Yeah. It's both. Think of it. Think of it in in this regard. Um, you know, when you search for something in Google, essentially what you're using are keywords that you're trying to use in order to find you know articles on a certain subject. The main difference there is that uh, Google is static. Essentially, that it's already information that has been set out there and mm -hmm. it's been indexed and it takes time to get there. The difference with Twitter is that instead of those same keywords that you use uh, in Google now are just preceded with the hashtag in Twitter, and Twitter is more of a real-time search engine. So what you find is that when you enter in those hashtags, aka those keywords, like you would in Google, you're gonna get real-time statements, the same way you would get the page ranks or the list of links that you would find in Google. And you could do it on a desktop, you don't have to have a- Oh, phone absolutely. Phone. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, Instagram Let's, you can't. Instagram is only for, for that maybe. Yeah. yeah. Let's, Instagram is only for. I mean, for a, it's meant it's meant for a phone. I'm sorry. Yeah. For a phone. It's only yeah. for mobile. Yeah. Let's um let's go back. We'll we'll open up to the Q and A in just a little bit, but let's go back to address some of the things that we had talked about before, mm -hmm. um, and let's consolidate some of these questions that we come up with. Let's let's each go down and talk about some excellent uses of social media that we have seen. Um, some really, really effective things that we've seen, and then we'll talk about some really ineffective things after that. So yeah, can we absolutely. just go down the line, start with sure. Eric? Um, effective social media, who follows George uh, Takai? Oh, yeah. yeah. So George has over four million followers, and George primarily just posts things that are fun, funny, interesting. Um, you know, so the majority of his, in, you know, in, They'll get like forty thousand likes, you know, ten thousand comments. This is Facebook, right? This is I'm sorry, this is him on Facebook. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and then so George's ability. This is this is my example of effective use of social media. He has these four million people that follow him because he's got this amazing point of view, 
And then recently, he's, he's been working on this musical about the Japanese internment camps called uh, Allegiance. Mm -hmm. And now he has four million people that he has permission to speak to. Yeah. So my example of good social media is, you know, I took this yoga class once and the yoga, the yoga teacher said, um, she, well, she told me afterwards that a good yoga class is giving people 70% of what they want and 30% of what they need or what, as a teacher what I want. So if you think of your social media like that, 70% should be like giving people this fun, engaging, emotional stuff. Mm -hmm. So you earn the ability to you know, use that other 30% for what you want to do, which perhaps if you're an artist, you want to promote yourself, you want to promote your gig, or you want to talk about something that, that you did. But mm -hmm. so that's mine. Yeah. I, I think that's fabulous advice, actually, for, uh, from a professional uh, standpoint. You know, I obviously there's the practical uses that I use it for, which is uh, announcing gigs or, or things that I'm doing. That's or, the thirty percent. Yeah, that's yeah. the thirty. Yeah. That's the thirty yeah. percent. And this is actually this is an area that I I personally would need to work on more. You know, I think I posted one joke one time. It was a tenor <laughs> joke. I love tenor jokes. So I, there you go. There's your social media identity. Seventy percent of your posts can be tenor jokes. Tenor jokes. jokes. <laughs> Don't make me tell it. I'll, later, it. find me. I'll tell you the tenor joke. And go. for the web people, go ahead and send it, send them to me. Yeah. I'm happy about them. Are there any particular <laughs> examples of of excellent uses uses of social media that you appreciated in the past couple of years or um, whether it's yes. an institution yes there's or one I'm thinking of specifically from Seattle Opera and it was recent and there I, you go. I rocked my world it was fantastic I uh, some people are gonna absolutely hate this but I loved it they recently did a whole synopsis of Carmen uh, as a Facebook conversation and oh, it, is, it is one of the most fantastic <laughs> yeah, things. Have you seen I this? So, you, yeah. you, you can see the nods in yeah. the audience, the, the people mm -hmm. who've seen it. It's amazing. If you haven't seen it, run out and see it after this, after this at uh, hashtag Seattle Opera Carmen <laughs> conversations. <laughs> Um, I, a, a classical music example of someone who really knows how to use social media, who knows Joyce DiDonato? Mm -hmm. um, she was one of the original pioneer music bloggers with me way back in the day when she was Yankee Diva. And she turned that into, she handled it so beautifully, the transitioning into um, all the different aspects of social media, so much so that to celebrate her 10 year anniversary with her recording, uh, recording label, she did a crowdsourced album using social media. She asked her fans what she should call it, what photos should be in the book. The, the photo on the cover was taken by a fan. Um, and and they, there are 31 tracks on the CD that the fans voted for. And I just think that's like... Yeah, that's awesome. And she had generated 10 years of goodwill, as we would call it, or you said, like, permission. Basically, yeah. 10 yeah. years of, mm -hmm. of cultivating this community that's and building these relationships. And she automatically has an audience of people. You yeah. know, she didn't, she didn't go out saying, I'm selling this CD. No. She went out with this idea of, like, join me in this artistic process. Mm -hmm. And by joining, you're getting that little piece of permission, mm -hmm. which then all those people that contributed, of course, are going to buy the album. Yeah. So it's really thinking yeah. through You're stuff vested that in that. It's, yeah. it's yeah. really beautiful. Where, if, yeah. if folks wanted to just see this, where, where could they go to see, like, I don't know her blog or what's her Twitter handle or just something where they could take a look at what she's yeah. doing. Yeah. She's, it's just her name. Yeah, right? yeah okay. she's everywhere. I know, I follow her. Joyce did it just Google her. Com. <laughs> she's Google her. Yeah. she's Twitter, Yankee Google. Diva on, on Twitter. Um, yeah. And YouTube as yeah. well. Yeah. Just so if you don't mind. George person, I'm sorry. George Takai was uh, Sulu on Sulu Star, Trek. Trek. On Star, Star Trek. Trek, yeah. T A K E I. T A K E I. George yeah, Takai. Yeah. And and Brody, one. What's a great successful example? You know, I'm actually going to take it in a very different direction because, I mean, you can go on Google. There are tons of books about you know how to how to success stories in social media and, and you know duct tape marketing and all the rest of these things and such like that, but. One extremely practical use that I find very, very helpful and works extremely well has a lot to do with Facebook. And it's the difference between having a profile and having a fan page. In particular, it has everything to do with privacy. Um, and it's, it's a major thing that it makes a huge difference because Facebook is, a very, is now a very professional setting. It is just as useful to have your fan page uh, constantly populated, very much in that 70-30 split. 
uh, with information about yourself uh, professionally that you want to put your face forward. But the other aspect of it too is that you know I have my own personal profile and I have a fan page. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The yeah. big difference is the directors, the artistic people who I you know want to get jobs with or continue relationships with, but I don't want to give them my profile per se, I send them my fan page. It gets them all the same information about my website, about what's going on with me professionally that I want to keep in that professional realm. Mm -hmm. Whereas my profile is hidden through all of the privacy settings, so the only people who can access any of my profile information are Very people friends. who I am directly friends with. Yeah. Which makes life a lot easier because although I'm not a picture taker, all of my friends are. <laughs> and I don't mind them posting because you know what? That's who I am. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's who I want to be professionally. Yeah. And I also divide, I, for, I use Twitter professionally because it's public. I mean, anybody yeah. can see anything searchable. that I post on Twitter. It's searchable. Yeah. So for me, that's my professional outlet. On Facebook, I have, it, it is me personally. It's friends and family. And then what I call frolics, like friend <laughs> colleagues. So like once somebody is in the frolic zone, I'll allow them. Exactly. But I, but I also, you know, the thing I'm about, the thing that's really good about Facebook is even for each post, for each status update, you can determine exactly who gets to see that post. So if I'm going to post something that's especially personal or political or whatever, I might not want my my colleagues or you know like the artistic administrator at the LA Phil to see. Mm -hmm. I just under right underneath the post, there's a little button you can click, and it says everybody accept or something like that, mm -hmm. and you click and you can type in names. Like I don't want Chad Smith to see this. Or it can be um, different groups of people. So I, I organize all my Facebook contacts by press, clients, mm -hmm. etc. And then on there, I will say, like, I want everybody except for clients to see this post. And I usually do that. If I'm promoting one client on Facebook, I hide it from my other clients. Because, you know, like, she loves, she loves them more than me. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> no, and, and actually, that makes, uh, that makes a lot more practical sense from the, from the PR standpoint, especially with, like, uh, publicists. You know, it, as a performer in my situation, I just take it one step further and completely separate my personal profile versus my public uh, professional fan page. Right. It allows me to just control everything that uh, yeah. anybody who's a friend can see anything that I do on a regular basis. As a performer, that can be that's a necessary step though to have a yeah. personal yeah. persona yeah. and a professional. Persona. So I think it's time to open up to questions. Unless I heard you take a breath. Do you want to? Well, do you to there was. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. One more social media tip that I think would be useful um, if you're performing and you're, um, you know, my company advises marketing departments of, of arts organizations and we're always looking for new angles on social media to promote our content so mm -hmm. if you're a performer and if you're willing to work with the institution and say you have a yes. following or you yeah. have a oh, voice yeah. um, make yourself available to do that for example we um, we're talking to our clients at Lincoln Center Theater and they, Michael Cerverus was actually really open to working with them. And he actually was taking pictures from backstage at these amazing points of view that the institution really can't have. And they were using those images and they actually did a, um, an event where they could, you could chat with Michael Cerverus. And so, you know, making yourself available to the team that's running the social media at the institution where you're working is a great way to A, grow your social media profile and also really help them. Oh, Excellent. Yeah, yeah let's, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, and I forgot to mention my favorite social media success, which was the Opera Plots. Oh, uh, yes. Twitter, which was so uh, much fun. Which is, uh, who launched, I tried to remember, was it Minnesota Opera? I think I don't, it was, actually. I don't remember who launched this, but they launched the hashtag Opera Plots on Twitter. And what it was, one of the fun things about Twitter is trying to get something to fit into 140 characters. So people who like are a little poetic or like haiku, it's like kind of a fun thing that you do on Twitter is you create these 140 character pieces of art. And so um, so what they did was they had a contest basically where, where people had to reduce an opera plot down to 140 characters with the hashtag <laughs> opera plot. So that took up some characters. But people had a heyday with it. Alex 
Ross was going nuts with it. All the journalists loved it because they're nerds. And all the, <laughs> all the singers loved it. Like, everybody loved it. It was so much fun. And that's the thing. Like, people like fun. And, and it's a different thing to be constantly tugging at someone's sleeve, like, come to my show. Come to my show. Just sending them event after event after event on Facebook. It's an entirely different thing to create this fun thing that people can be part of. So just thinking creatively about how you interact with people on social media yeah. is very important. Okay, questions. You mentioned, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Okay, so uh, just to, you know, <laughs> about 10 minutes ago, media time, which is like, yeah, now. <laughs> no, there were emails, an e blast. If you had a concert coming up, you do an e blast with MailChimp or with Constant Contact. Right. Is mm -hmm. that kind of over? Is it now just nobody does it anymore now? It's just. Facebook splash kind of thing, or no? I, I think it's important to do all. We might have different opinions, I, you know, as we go down the line. But but I would say, yeah, at, about that at all, yeah right? from the from the PR standpoint, it's still important to have uh, people who have actively subscribed to your. You know, you can call it a list, but I prefer not to call it a list when talking to mm -hmm. people. Like with journalists, we would say, "Would you like for us to stay in touch about?" Our artists, and they would say yes, and then we would that would be permission to put them on a list, which is something important we talked about before. It is it is actually illegal mm -hmm. to put someone's email on your mailing list without their permission. Mm -hmm. It's illegal, and it's also really rude, and it's a way to to ingratiate yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, make sure that before you start blasting somebody with emails, they have said that they want to hear from you, and it doesn't have to be "May I add you to my mailing list?" It can be. Do you mind if I stay in touch about what's coming up for me? It can be, you know, something casual like that, but you need the permission. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we also talked about the importance of using, yeah, there's, there's constant contact, there's eye contact, there's MailChimp, all these different platforms that you can use. Um, you can use just regular email, but make sure that you put everybody in the BCC field mm -hmm. um, because it is it is also a big faux pas to send out an email to lots of people where everybody gets to see who else was on that email because and some people emails are private yeah, yeah so emails are yeah, private, it's private. It's, it's, emails are private we didn't talk at all about privacy tonight but i think that's a whole other a <laughs> whole other aspect yeah. but that's a that's another yeah thing for laura lee next year <laughs> so all of the above yeah. all of the above yeah. yes you mentioned a few minutes ago you talked about the effective things of social media i would love to hear the Oh, okay. Okay. Like seen that were like, oh, the horror stories of what to avoid. Definitely. Yeah. Like, I'll start because I because I kind of said it already. For me, I I think because people know that I'm a publicist and they think like, oh, like she knows she'll like talk to people about things. They I get invited to like so many <laughs> events every day from people that I have never met before and I don't know them and they don't know me and they've never taken the time to ask me you know who I am or have a conversation with me and they just start spamming me inviting me to events and I think that's a that's a big ineffective thing that I see it's so common on social media and it's easy on Facebook to just like click people's names and like invite them to an event but think about what it's like on the receiving end mm -hmm. if you haven't generated that goodwill yeah. if you haven't cultivated a relationship with somebody if you haven't gotten permission yeah. as you call it I mean yeah. I say um, you want to ask yourself two things before you send any communication especially for email is it anticipated meaning did the person sign up for it mm -hmm. is it relevant do they care at all about it? Is it in? If, and is, is it if personal? It, yeah. If it's a show, do they live in New York? And is this show in San Francisco? Right. Right. Why are you inviting right. them to it? Anticipated, yeah. relevant, and personal. Those yeah. are the three things for per, what we call permission marketing. Excellent. So yeah. you're not going to have that permission if it's not. If you're and even calling in an e blast, that drives me crazy because mm -hmm. blasting is the opposite <laughs> of anticipated, relevant, and personal. <laughs> it's a it's a targeted email for people who yeah. care about you, and the same thing goes on social media. Social media, bad social media is about me. Me, mm -hmm. me, 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 me. Look at me, look at this great job I got. Look how mm -hmm. awesome I am. Look at all these things I was cast and look at how great my video is. Right. It needs to be about someone else. And very, very occasionally it can be about you. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why, why Joyce was so good at it. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. she just made it about the people who are reading. Yeah, you know? that's right. She's, she's amazing. Yeah. No one if, cares about you. Yeah, if, uh, <laughs> if, if, and if you, if you put out like thing after thing every day, you know, even if it's not about you, yeah. if you if you overwhelm me with content, I will hate you, <laughs> and I will it will have the opposite effect from what you want. I will not look at what you're posting. And I will I will stop looking at everything you do, and not as not because it's punitive. It's just it's just you know 
consequence of, of spamming me. And frankly, the social media networks are smart. Facebook, every time any one of us opens any Facebook account, there's mm -hmm. 1,500 stories could be first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So Facebook ranks what they think is the most relevant to you. So if you're putting out content that no one's liking, commenting, or sharing, no one's going to see your com content because Facebook wants to deliver the most relevant information to the people who care about it. Mm -hmm. So if you're putting out their content that's only about promoting you and no one's engaging with it, liking, commenting, or sharing, then it's going to go, it's never, no one's going to see it. Mm -hmm. So you can put yeah, it out there many times the bottom, so it'll just, yeah. or not at all. Yeah. Or not at all, yeah. That's oh, a good yeah. point. Well, I was just going to say, I think the, the number one mistake that people make with social media, well, two, <laughs> over, <laughs> oversharing. We all know what does what does that mean? I guess maybe we should say what does oversharing means? It means if I am using my professional Twitter feed, I should not talk to you about my temper tantrums with my three year old. You know, like that's Henry. oversharing. Henry, yes, we all. <laughs> <laughs> Henry needs his own Twitter account. I think, but um, I have a precocious three year old. But you know, it's keep it keep it relevant, keep it focused, um, and and also just being un unprofessional. Um, which I think I don't we don't have any 20 year olds here I don't think but I think like teenagers and younger people really have a tendency to forget about the boundaries that should mm -hmm. exist in the professional world even in something like social media which is very casual Twitter is very casual um, if they learned them a lot of there's a whole generation coming up that's, that's yeah. different you know, it's instant gratification. It's I can yeah. do this, I can do that. But it's also you know. the, I mean, and we could, that's a whole other that's a, conversation, one, but yeah. the idea oh, yeah. of personal and professional <laughs> being separate yeah. is yeah. is more of an aging idea. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, yeah. And Brody, terrible, terrible oh, social media. I think pretty much everybody's <laughs> nailed it on the head so far as what not to do. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like the worst things you know, I, I spent a lot of time reading um, feeds like Hacker News and such like that. And I think some of the hardest things that you can end up doing is putting something out there, you know, speaking well before you think uh, and end up having to redact a lot. I think that at the end of the day, like if you start, you know, trying to tout off something and you, you know, the hard part about, I think, just the web in general, what you find in, in forums and all the rest of this is you have this extra extra wall between you where you kind of start to feel a little more invincible, especially with stuff like Twitter. Um, yeah, yeah. It's kind of what Andy was alluding to earlier in that regard is that you can find yourself at a point where you're just starting to throw things out there because you can and it's not really going to affect you per se. But when it comes back to bite you all of a sudden, when you have to redact something, yeah. that becomes far worse than putting out the original problem. What, what you'll find with a lot of businesses in particular, if, uh, you know, for instance, take a look at what went on with uh, Chick-fil-A and, and uh, their comments about gay rights and all the rest of that, the problems weren't, the nest, weren't entirely based on the original comments themselves. It was how they handled the comments and then how they handled the reactions to the comments that screwed them. And you're sitting back going, you know, it, and it can happen to us in those regards. Uh, I know a lot of friends of mine who, who post backstage photos and stuff like that on, on Facebook Make and sure Twitter you have permission and, to do that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and sometimes those companies come back and say, you know, what are you doing? And then you start deleting these things. Well, all of a sudden people have seen them and they started commenting, especially on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And then depending on the picture or, or comments or other things like that, all of a sudden that blows up more often. So I think that's kind of the hard part is 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 obviously not doing all the bad things to begin with, but then figuring out once you've actually done something wrong, that's what really blows up is how you handle the reaction yeah. afterwards. Get advice before you respond. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So it's it's eight. If anybody needs to leave, please feel free because the session can be officially over. If you'd like to stay and you have another question, we're we're happy to answer it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Uh, and Carolyn, yes. you mentioned in passing about blogging, blogging, and then not blogging. Yeah. And as an artist who likes to write and is thinking about it, you know, composer, mm -hmm. uh, and looks at a lot of other composers and critics' blogs, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts? And, and whoever else on the panel would like. You know, it's so fun. I'm, I'm glad you asked because I just thought, oh, we didn't really get to talk about, about blogging. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think t Twitter and things are kind of starting to move into the fore. But blogging, I think, will always have a place because a lot of us creative people, we also are writers in mm -hmm. addition to the other things that we do. For me, personally, the main reason I stopped, I, I wrote the concert um, to 
kind of most started it for my family to chronicle the beginnings of my career. And it and I kept it up for about six years and until two things happened. My career reached a point where I, I couldn't, I could no longer be as frank about the difficulties of my career, oh, rehearsal pro, rehearsal things that weren't very great or um, didn't want to expose my tender underbelly of having a hard time and you know that sort of thing. And also I fell in love and started a family and so it just became less important. Um, but recently I have found that I miss it. I miss that outlet for writing. Uh, and so a few months ago I started another blog um, uh, ostensibly together with my husband, who's also a singer, called Mom and Papra. <laughs> 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 but now I'm dealing with the whole, like, figuring out what what is that? What What is that brand? How does it fit into my... It, is it a mommy blog? Is it a music blog? That assumes mm-hmm. that you have a child and you're going to be mentioning that child. Yeah, it's and, I, you know, right? I yeah. don't... I, so then it's appropriate to do so because you've set that expectation. That's true. Exactly. That's true. Actually, thank you for mm-hmm. saying that. I guess yeah. I, I've been worried um, just a, how it all fits into the picture of what of what I'm doing. So I got a really good one you should look at. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think if you are looking to start um, a blog, I I would encourage you to write and you know just r- write about whatever you want in terms of you know, connecting it with your music. I think the biggest mistake, talking about things that don't go well with social media, just because you can write as many words as you want doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. The number of times I start to read a blog that I think is really has some great things to say and it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's like a New Yorker article on a blog and it just is too much. One scroll, I always say. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. Good writing's in the editing. Um, Yes. To your point, like Copy Blogger is a great resource for that. They talk about Copy Blogger is is a website. And there's another one called Men with Pens it's, uh, that is really about <laughs> good <laughs> good writing. But I mean, when you're writing for the web, you want to write short Sometimes sentences. You want to write short paragraphs. How do you start the best ways to cool. actually go? To, I mean, there's lots well, there are of different platforms. Right? Do you want to take that? Sure. I mean, there's many different platforms from WordPress to Blogger to I mean, you can just Tumblr. Google, yeah, Google blog, blog software. Um, I think. Thank you. Blogging is great for keywords. So mm-hmm. in terms yeah. of like increasing your SEO relevancy, if you have a blog where you're ta- talking about opera or talking about being a composer or you're using, it really just increases your, your web clout because for example, like my company, um, when we talk about like a selector and seat tool that, that we worked on for a client, now when you Google like selector and seat, hmm. it goes to our website, even hmm. though that's not, that's one of the many things that we do, <laughs> but it puts keywords out there that are longer tail, meaning, you know, like if there are not many people who are Googling selector and seat, it's not written about on that many sites. And so the fact that it's on our blog, we get traffic from those keywords. So it allows you to really reach out there and increases your, your yeah. relevancy in search. So the platforms are, there's Blogger, WordPress, Tumblr, what am I missing? Other, that's good that's stuff. And we didn't even talk about like Instagram and, and other photo sites. Really but, uh, yes, yeah. the question. So I, have, I have two questions actually. Um, first question is if you have like multiple sort of creatives or non creative things that you're doing. Like for me, for my example, like I'm a singer, I also do modern dance, and I do a lot of freelance um, personal and administrative assistant work. Mm-hmm. Um, naturally, I don't want to put all those things in one mm-hmm. page that's a lot of information. Is it okay to have? sort of three separate identities that link to each other. Oh, yeah. Like sort of like on my um, singer page, like, oh, these are the other things that I do. You can read more about them here. I, my, I would say yes, but um, you don't, you, uh, be careful. <laughs> Because you don't want it to seem like you are unfocused. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I would maybe yeah. connect the two creative things, mm-hmm. link link to those, oh, yeah, and then separate. have sep- se- yeah. the non-creative yeah. work yeah. separate. Do you need that third place thing to be public, or is that something that you want to... I mean, think about... It's something re- I would eventually like to sort of replace my day job. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's, with the, the administrative stuff? Yeah. 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 Well, well, look at actually in, in this case, which... Um, Part of the rebranding process that I'm going through right now, uh, I've been out of performing for about a year and a half. Uh, my last gig was March of last year. Uh, and a lot, I mean, most of that was because I'm going into this vocal transition. Uh, but what I'm finding now with schedule arts in particular is, is that 
you know, on a rather regular basis, we're meeting with the general and artistic directors of some of the biggest opera companies in the world, which is great on the business side of it. But what we are going to run into at some point in particular is that the business aspect and our business identities could possibly eclipse our uh, artistic uh, our artistic identities in those regards. And it's a little bit different because Andy and I actually have both two very different artistic identities that are allowed to bring them together. In my case, what I'm doing is I'm going with a stage name for my artistic side, and then I'm using my my you know my real name for the business side. Mm -hmm. And I'm making two you know my my business information will be on ScheduleArts.com and Inspired Revolutions and such like that, mm -hmm. but all of my artistic stuff will be completely separate. I won't link the two together, I won't put them there, because that way when I go to audition, for if any reason somebody goes to say, and you know, for instance, if a company happens to be using Schedule Arts, and then goes, oh, I think this may be the same person, that could be okay. But it could also come into a situation in which the general director you know, of some of these big companies may come down and say, oh yeah, I, I know them very well you know, in these regards. It could eventually hurt me because I oh, have he's that not a singer, focus. he's a programmer. Right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. You know, managing those identities in those regards. Uh, I find mm -hmm. even on a tighter schedule too, or in a tighter formation, the singers who also offer teaching capabilities, who have their own studios, a lot of times people will come to me and ask, well, should I put my studio information on my website as well? Because they want to have most of it all about their uh, personal stuff. And so what I have them do is just create a single page with their information towards the bottom so that their students and people can still find that information, but that they focus the website primarily around their main goal, which is being an active performer. That way you can have them together without actually trying to redact because you're unfocused, quote unquote. Yeah, and one other example, we worked with a composer, Jonathan Berger, who's also a Stanford professor and um, he does a lot of research with um, like auditory hallucinations and, and other mm -hmm. things. And we were helping him design his website and trying to make sense of all this. So it was actually part of our web design <laughs> process was figuring out what the balance was in these two aspects of his career, how they informed one another, how we could reflect that visually. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and so there's kind of like a two-sided website where people can click about researcher versus composer. Um, and, and that's another way. If, if the dance and the singing inform one another mm -hmm. and are linked, and if they support one another, there could be a way to approach it that way. I want to kind of jump in on what they're saying here. I mean, we're kind of getting at branding, you know, and and branding is hard. <laughs> I mean, it's difficult, and it and you have to be careful, and you you have to think very clearly about what you want your brand to say about you, and then you have to not confuse it. Yeah, the, so. I mean, the takeaway with all of this is that you you do need to know who you are and what you're about and what you're good at, and you want to make sure that everything about you, whether it's your photos, materials, bio, Twitter presence, Facebook presence, Instagram, blogging reinforces that message. Mm -hmm. If it does, then then go with it and if it doesn't, don't. You know? Which actually to help with that in particular, um, you know, one of the things we've kind of sort of touched on in the process of all of this is design matters. Not how much you spend on it, but how it reflects who you are. When we're talking about the types of photographs that you're getting that you're having taken and your headshots and all of that. Another thing to take into consideration, which a lot of people don't end up doing, um, which is why they come to me, is color theory. Just yeah, Google it and shows. read mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. first of all, there's so many there are so many performers in general now who are going and building their websites with these black backgrounds and and uh, I know Andy here's that. One I too. might have a black background. I helped him with. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being a hypocrite. Right under the bus. <laughs> There's a bright orange no. splash on it. Oh, cool. No, no, no. But, but the, the thing, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at essentially is that it's okay to use it in that regard if it complements, for instance, the photos that he has that are working, work and complement the background. And we used an accent color to bring things out in those regards. But you have to take a look at what those colors mean and what those colors actually influence. Because using a bright yellow versus a subdued closer to like a gold or something like that gives you a completely different perception. How you use different shades of red changes 
everything about how somebody perceives you right off the block. And does that communicate who you are as an artist? Like exactly. back to that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, oh, sorry. Was there something we were trying to show? Yeah. I was going to say. I, I was going to say. ACB is going to pull something up on okay, the screen okay. while she is nice. while she is hunting. Um, it may take it a minute because it's tired. Did you there get it. your question answered? I was going to say. Did you get your question answered? Oh, I'm oh, sorry. Nice. I, love, I love this use of color. Yeah. It's much like, agreed. Yeah. I'm sorry. There's one more question. What, what, yeah. What is too little? Like, for example, I I've been on Facebook since 2005. It's a long history there, but I feel a little silly having mm. a fan page because most of it's my good friends and family. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not going to post every five minutes and et cetera, et cetera. And I'll also, if on the administrative side, if you have a company like a small opera company, how little is too little? Will people like, oh, this is boring. There's nothing here. Can you? Stagger things so that it's still interesting and relevant without sort of the overkill. And if you don't have, like, I'm not Joyce, you know, I don't have something interesting going on all the time. <laughs> well, so I'm sorry. Sorry. And I, yes. I want to be able you want to take that? Stuff. I mean, what yeah. about LinkedIn? Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. use. No, I'm, I'm on, I'm on yeah. LinkedIn. People said about the Facebook, you know, separate your, your yeah. personal and your professional and have a fan page and those sorts of things. And I do a professional Twitter feed, but. You know, I do think you a fan page, okay. yeah, in, until you do have some level of a following, I think it's fun, it's a, it could be a little strange to have a fan page. It be presumptuous. Page. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little presumptuous to have a fan page, I think, until you have a certain right. level of, of following. So and then again, like Facebook is a, you know, I think you can use your idea of circles, like allow people in, group them, and you can use Facebook as the same person, but perhaps you only show your it's a great point. Your posts that are personal to certain people, and if you know people have followed you or fanned you because or liked you because they they're professionally interested, mm -hmm. then only give them access yeah. to those posts. Yeah. And don't ever feel pressured to use a, a platform, social media platform that's just not you. You know that that doesn't work for you. Just make sure you have something to send professional contacts to. Sorry about that. Okay. I just wanted to show this I, as I was researching. I'm, going to be redoing my website soon and as I was looking for interesting awesome. innovative singer team. websites Laura's site really I mean it popped out at me literally because I'm she the, um, well, yeah. the use All of color good. and her title is putting the color in coloratura brilliant I'm sorry that's brilliant <laughs> yeah. but, you guys didn't hear this but as soon as she pulled that up each one of us separately said that's awesome yeah and uh, none of us have yeah. ever seen it before we all thought it was spectacular Laura instantly was one of the very first singers to have a website right she was a very early blogger yes mm -hmm. had this a long mm -hmm. yeah time. she got well, it's it. aspirational it right. I'm not yeah. saying you have to go do that but mm -hmm. like look at the potential yeah, yeah. 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 right <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't <laughs> Of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the other thing you got to realize too is you have to start somewhere. I mean, yeah. like we yeah. were talking about the fan page and such like that. Um, That's so. Good. You know, it, it is kind of weird so and presumptuous yeah. to have a fan page in that regard uh, when Without you don't have a big following. Right. But you got to start somewhere. You got to get to twenty before you can get to fifty, mm -hmm. and you just kind of kind of go there. And it depends on where you are in your career. A lot of it has to do with how you're driving people to it. For instance, you know, in order to really kind of start gathering that following, it's not just about posting content. It's about how you're bringing people to it. So, you know, as I mentioned with the way that I'm kind of handling it is that anytime I meet like a certain director or conductor or, you know, somebody in a company that I want to be able to, to communicate with professionally, not only do I give them my website information, but I'll give them the, the Facebook profile or the fan page that they can then kind of keep up to date if they so choose. And you can start directing them in that regard because it's going to take you some time to build that audience. And as far as posting is concerned, uh, you know, one of the things that I found in particular with blogging, and I'm, I'm sure that Eric will uh, hopefully agree with me in this regard, is it's more about consistency. It doesn't matter so much how much. Yeah. If you're only posting one thing a week, it's fine as people long as get you're used to that. Yeah, as as long as you condition people to start doing it. You don't have to start doing a lot, and then you can do some intermittent stuff in between for you know if you want to just get something out there quick because it was a really good promo yeah. thing. And if you're gonna if you're going to have three months where you're not blogging or for whatever reason, then you would say you would post about the fact that you're going to be away. I mean, it's like setting these expectations with people. Okay, exactly. now are we? Now we have to stop. All right. Okay. <laughs> we all have to stop, stop. But you all are welcome to speak to the panelists, but I encourage you to get a glass of wine or water. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Was this helpful? Yeah. Yes? Helpful, useful, informative? <laughs> Thank you, all of you, our panelists, you. very much for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.